phone. We'll be ready. Good morning. May it please the court. I am Kevin Funk with the law firm of Direct Crump on behalf of the appellants, uh, Ron and Terry Bradley, William Earhart, and Ryan Madison. Your Honors, the judgment of the district court affirming the bankruptcy court's award of damages and the finding of contempt against my clients must be reversed for two reasons. First, the Bradleys and their counsel did not violate the discharge injunction of 524 by prosecuting the Minnesota State Court action for the purpose of recovering from the Minnesota Contractor Recovery Fund, or the MCRF. But second, even if the Bradleys and their counsel did commit a technical violation of 524's discharge injunction, the contempt power of the court and the imposition of damages in this case were not warranted. What, what, what are you calling if there's a technical violation? Do you consider filing a lawsuit asking for a recovery against the discharge debtor to be a technical violation? Uh, I, uh, we don't consider that to be because... You said if it is. I'm, I'm, I'm going to explore that with you. Okay, if, if it is, what is the technical violation which you consider it? If it is, what is that technical violation? I think the court may find, as did the, the court below and the bankruptcy court, that the, the not going back to the bankruptcy court to get a modification of the discharge injunction was a violation of... a technical violation? Well, because... Uh, well, again, we don't think it is, but, e but if you find it to be, as the bankruptcy court did... Right. If, I, it is, if it is a violation, mm -hmm. if it is a violation, why is that violation a technical violation? Is well, it just a violation that the court can punish? Well, because sir, there was no... Um, there was no real uh, a desire to collect personally well, from the that, debtor. It, do we review that for abuse of discretion? I, I believe that there is, it's, a, it's a mixed right. question because the, the filing of the complaint and the answer admitting that the sole purpose of the state court action. You know what I'm asking, what is our review? We review it, it in the imposition of the sanction. Is that an abuse of discretion? And then you'd have to look at questions of facts that support that for some other basis. If, if the court finds that there was a violation of the discharge injunction, right. it is an abuse of discretion standard to review the award of sanctions. It is a de novo review. Well, then why, could, why couldn't any court look at the complaint? In the complaint, aren't you limited by the statute for a $50,000 recovery from the fund in Minnesota? Yes, Your Honor. And didn't the complaint seek more than $50,000 in damages? The complaint did seek an attorney's fees award. And I no, have no, I'm asking, I'm, I'm going to get to that. I'm okay. talking about actual named damages. Didn't the complaint seek more than $50,000? I believe it did seek about $54,000 I, I think it's $58,000. A $58,000. But it's, it, exceeds, yes, Your Honor. it exceeds the payout cap of the fund, correct? Yes. And you also, the complaint seeks attorney's fees, correct? That's correct. And the statute caps at $50,000? Yes. And does not allow attorney's fees. That's correct. Why then couldn't the court, couldn't the court, if the court wanted to, or any court looking at that, find that that was seeking some personal liability on the part of the discharged debtor? No, I don't believe the bankruptcy court could find that. Why couldn't you? Because there's two different uh, things at issue here. You've got an ad damnum clause <laughs> that asks for the court to establish the damages that right. the Bradleys incurred. But on the first page of the complaint, the, the Bradleys stated that the sole purpose was to collect from the MCRF. I understand that, but that's the kind of stuff that gets litigated later as to what the court can award and can't award and what you're asking for and what you're not asking for. If there's a technical violation, isn't it a violation on the part of the lawyers who drafted the complaint seeking damages and seeking attorney's fees beyond what they're allowed under the statute? I don't think that that makes it a violation, particularly... It is a violation. If you think that falls on the lawyers or it falls on the lay people? I, I think that it would fall on the lawyers because it would result in a technical... It, 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 it results in a distinction between what the Bradleys intended. Well, and what it, if the Bradleys intended only to collect from the fund, but the lawyers had asked for $3 million? Would that be a technical violation in your view? 
I, I, I don't think it would be a violation if, as long as they made the disclaimer. Because, again, I think there's a distinction between asking the court to fi make a finding of damage and then saying, but the only thing I'm ever going to do with this is to take it to the Minnesota Contractor Recovery Fund and seek my statutory cap. Right, but an intentional act or a willful act does not require bad faith. That's correct. So you just have to do something intentionally, right? That's, that is the Fourth Circuit standard for willful. And so I think what, but what, what happened here was uh, there was no violation because they specifically disclaimed any intent to do anything beyond take this to the Minnesota Contractor Recovery Fund and ask to get their, their award. The state court was required to take them at their word, notwithstanding their pleadings asking for additional money and asking for recovery of attorney's fees. So the court was obligated, had to accept their their representation. Isn't that the, the gravamen of your argument here? N no, Your Honor. What they are obligated to accept is the admission of the debtor. And that's what makes the, the answer, I mean, the, the amended complaint and the answer together a dispositive issue. Because the amended complaint said, this is all we're going to do. And I think if, if, that, if the story stopped there, the court could make further inquiries. But the story doesn't stop there. They, they stated that the sole purpose was to collect from the MCRF. And then the debtor admitted that allegation in his answer, represented by counsel. And so once he makes that admission under Minnesota procedural law, that stands in the place of any further evidence on the point of what the intent of the Bradleys was. And we cited uh, some Minnesota case law on that point. So the bankruptcy court was prohibited from going any further as to what the Bradleys' intent was once the debtor admitted that allegation in the amended complaint. I, I can't find it right now. In the amended complaint, what was your prayer for relief? Did it have that in any other relief that's appropriate? I just can't find it. Did it say that? Um, I, it, I know that I have to take you a know, look at it. You, I don't know off the top of my head. I know it had it broke it out by count because there was a negligence, there was a breach of warranty, and it had I separately you identified If you don't know, then you don't know. Oh, I well, don't. We'll look at the record. Oh, thank you. But even if their sole intent was to collect from the fund, or you still have the problem that they didn't go to court to ask permission. No, I, I, Your Honor, I don't think that's a problem. Um, the only circuit court case that I have found on point uh, that addresses this in its holding is Green v. Welsh, and that was the Second Circuit case uh, that we cited in our reply brief. And in that case, the Second Circuit held that modification of the discharge injunction was not necessary to maintain a suit nominally against the debtor to go after the insurance. Well, that's proceeds. different. There's a contract. Um, and, and why should the third party be penalized, third party seeking to recover when there's existence of an insurance contract that provides liability coverage? Why should a third party be penalized simply because a party to the contract is in, in uh, bankruptcy? The premiums have been paid. Uh, the uh, contractual liability is there. Uh, it's a totally different situation than what we have here. Your Honor, I, I don't see it as being a, a totally different circumstance because it's, this, it's a similar situation. The recovery fund in Minnesota is set up, funded with taxpayer dollars. It's there for people who are harmed by the actions of a contractor. And why should the citizen's um, ability to go after that funds set up for Minnesota citizens be impacted by a contractor who goes bankrupt. And I, I, so I don't see, and I know the district court made that distinction, but I don't think the fact that the, it arises out of contract makes it any different when a state sets up a fund to collect. Let, let me ask you something different. Mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 the, you have to have a, at least a measure of sympathy for what occurred here in terms of your client. You know, they, they received arguably a bad job at the hands of their contractor. They then hired a lawyer to see what they could do. Mm -hmm. They went on the lawyer's advice, and then they not only out the money, but then they have to pay lawyer's fees, and then they get this whopping fine of $30,000, all because they wanted to do a few repairs to their house. Yes. You know, I understand. If you were writing the opinion of the court, 
how would you get them out of it? Uh, given the bankruptcy laws, given the definition of an intentional act, given and assuming that we don't accept your insurance analogy, how what what rationale, and and how would you deal with the fact that they asked for more than the contractor fund allowed? How if you were writing the opinion, how would you deal with those issues? Uh, Your Honor, I would I would argue that. 524 only prohibits attempts to make a judgment a personal liability. And the debtor admitted in his answer that the Bradley's sole purpose was to collect from the MCRF. So if they asked for a million dollars. You aren't limited by that because I've looked up the amended complaint. Yes. And you do ask for, you ask for that over, I think it's over $58,000 mm -hmm. specific dimension damages, cost and disbursements, reasonable attorney's fees, and you add, awarding plaintiffs any such other relief as the court deems just and equitable. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, that doesn't limit you. We have these arguments all the time about what somebody's really seeking in a lawsuit when they ask for any other relief that may be awarded. Is mm -hmm. that equitable? Is that legal? We have those arguments all the time. Mm -hmm. What would happen if the court looking at this says, I have looked at that statute, and I think I have broad equitable powers, and I'm going to award you over $50,000. Mm -hmm. You would then the lawyers for the plaintiffs would have said, "Dear God, do not give us that money that we asked for. Please don't do that." They would have said that no. because you've asked no. the court to do it. So why doesn't that expose? Now the court could be wrong mm -hmm. in doing that, but you could still get a judgment against the uh, discharged debtor, notwithstanding his understanding of what the plaintiffs mm -hmm. were seeking, that would impose liability beyond fifty thousand and would impose liability on him. Isn't that at least possible? It, it, the, it's very possible that the court would make an award more than the statutory cap based on the ad damnum. Right. But I don't think that changes the debtors. It doesn't change what the Bradleys could do with it. They could never do any more. Well, you don't know about that. That's what you're saying now. But I would suspect that if somebody got an award of, say, if the judge entered the order and said, I've looked at the statute, I think courts have interpreted the statute incorrectly, and you're mm -hmm. entitled to more money, mm -hmm. I'm giving you everything you asked for, plus another $15,000, mm -hmm. then there would be litigation about whether or not that was collectible, if the plaintiffs wanted to pursue it. And they would, vi they would clearly violate the discharge injunction under that. And that's what the gravamen of our argument really is. The it, it, only, it only comes about after they've won the lawsuit? After they win the lawsuit, Your Honor, under these recovery funds, you then take it to the re recovery fund, and they only write you a check for $50,000. So it didn't matter if it was a million dollars. Well, that's fine for you to say that. Mm -hmm. But is that imposing liability on the potential for pose imposing liability on a discharged debtor by way of this lawsuit? It seems to me clearly it is. Well, it sure, wouldn't. Because if you've docketed the judgment, you have a right to come back later and collect on it. Well, you're, and Your Honor, there was testimony that they would not, they never intended to dock at the judgment, and they didn't need to dock at the judgment. In Minnesota, there are two indices. There's a judgment index and a... Do, and a that, all, that all sounds fine mm -hmm. after the fact to say that. But, mm -hmm. by the way, if they had different lawyers, they may, some other lawyer may advise them and go, no, I'm talking about after the trial. Mm -hmm. You won that money, and we think the judge is correct. It's a fair reading of the law. You go dock at that judgment, and you have a claim against him. And even if you don't try to collect it, it still may affect his credit worthiness mm -hmm. and other things. It seems to me you're making a great argument to look at it after the fact and what may have happened, but that is not what anybody is bound to <laughs> under the law beforehand. Thank you. My time is up. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Hall. Please, the court, Richard Hall, appearing counsel for the appellant. I have to confess, Your Honors, that uh, all this talk about nervousness in the prior case has, in fact, made me a little nervous. But in any event, Your Honor. <laughs> we, we sent a dog out to set your card. <laughs> <laughs> to see if, there any, see if there are any cases left in there, you should argue that you have. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you for that reassuring. Mr. Funk, I'm, I'm going to start with, uh, Thank you. with Judge uh, Keenan's question suggested. Why shouldn't we find in this case that the court abused its discretion in awarding sanctions of thirty-some thousand dollars when it is the most painfully pitiful circumstance you can imagine? You get your house fixed, they don't fix it. You get a contract, you don't get your house fixed, and then you spend all the money, 
and then you wind up getting $30,000 against you. Isn't that over the top? Given the fact that, and counsel call it technical, but technical or not, in, in the long scheme of things, they were trying to get money from a generous Minnesota fund that helped poor people, not poor, I mean, beset people in circumstances like this. Isn't that just too much money? You know, I often reflect that if everything, everyone does everything they should do perfectly, I wouldn't have much business. I agree, <laughs> I agree. And the same um, thing for the court as well. We, we have to we adjudicate things with imperfections. My answer to your question is this. The appellants, the, the Bradleys in this case, had their hand on the switch at all points. They could have done what is usually the case. They could have gone to the bankruptcy court and simply asked to modify the stay. That's, that's what normally happens. I mean, since this case was... And we know that because the court actually did what they could have asked for even after giving right. sanctions against them. So that, that's that. absolutely correct. Right. And they, and, but yet they carried it. And Mr. Fisher, in the, in the litigation before it went to bankruptcy court, asked that they, they stop, but they didn't do it. So they carried it forward. They might have at any point stopped and short-circuited all of these damages. But if you don't award damages to the debtor in this case, the debtor, is, in this case and in all other cases, is in a no-win position. Because he has to go forward and be in court and defend his discharge and pay the attorneys for doing that, pay the cost of doing that. If he's not recompensed for that cost, if he's not insured against that cost, then in many cases he may well say, it's just not worth the cost to me, or I can't afford it. I just have to let fate take its course and hope that you know I'm blessed in some way. Well, it sort of frustrates the purpose of the bankruptcy code and the discharge if the debtor who's discharged is then still subject to collection efforts that he, and by the way, we're talking about lay people, you get sued by somebody asking for $58,000 in attorney's fees. You may have thought you had some protection from the bankruptcy code, but you've got to do something That's to true. protect yourself. You have to do something as well, don't you? That's true, Your Honor. And one of the changes in the 78 revision of the code from the Act, in the Act you didn't have that particular aspect of the of 524. You didn't have an injunction. If you were, You could be sued in state court on a discharged claim, and you would have to go into court and raise the discharge as a defense. Now, to prevent that sort of abuse, or as they saw it in abuse, they, they revised uh, that section and put it in the code that there was an injunction against uh, asserting a claim. Particularly, as in this case, an injunction against filing a complaint or issuing process. Your Honors, I wanted to point out something, if I could. Um, there's a dispute between counsel and I about the record, and this places a great burden on, on you, and I'm sorry for it, to, to look at the record carefully and, and uh, see who is right, if you will. This morning, as it would happen, in going through this, I, I saw an error in the record. The transcript made from the court was, was incorrect, and later Judge Mayer went back and had a, an amended transcript uh, drafted but somehow, and I apologize, it's my fault for not seeing it, the unamended transcript made its way into the record. And uh, I don't know how to present it to you, but on page 444, line 1, where Judge Mayer indicates that uh, there was a, an objective standard, he meant subjective standard, and that appears in the amended transcript, which is what I was working with all through the case. You can see from the context that he really meant uh, objective and not subjective. Who is, who is the award against in this case? It is against all of the parties, Your Honor. And that would be the homeowners and who else? That would be Ronald and Terry Bradley, Mr. Madison and Mr. Erhardt. And, and the Bradleys are the homeowners? They are the homeowners. And who are the other two? The other two are the attorneys who handled the case. Uh, the record so what happens in this case is, and it certainly is, I think my colleagues have said it and I agree, it really is sort of a bad thing for the poor homeowners who trying to just get somebody to be responsible for what happened to them is that they see it and then they do some work and I think it's the case that the lawyers at the fund suggest to them their complaint needs to be redone yes but they still don't quite get it right when it would have been easily uh, reconciled with the law by just having lawyers approach the bankruptcy court just 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 in you know, being sure you're doing everything right. But the bottom line is, these folks have lost 
maybe because of maybe because of what the lawyers did in the legal documents, but the lawyers are responsible on this this award as well, aren't they? That is true, Your Honor. And and that may be a claim that might be adjusted or should be adjusted between the parties. But the lawyers are acting I, as I would suspect it would be. So I, I don't know. I would suspect as well. But in terms of who is liable, the, the appellants, the Bradleys, are liable for the actions of their agency attorneys. And the, Mr. Bradley is an attorney, actually, and he had drafted the first complaint. And he's not a novice or a layperson. True, I will admit that none of the parties here had any experience, any significant experience in bankruptcy law, and they'd admitted that in the transcript. They believed that Minnesota law allowed them to do this. I'd like to, to raise another point that was argued by my colleague. But I want to take back to one point. So you see it as, although although you might not acknowledge this, those homeowners pursuing some remedy, I mean, they're just trying to get some relief they think they're entitled to, but you sort of see that under any circumstances. You have to balance that off against the discharged debtor who followed the law, who did follow the law, and found himself in a position of having to defend a lawsuit. That's correct, but I would resist also the, the notion that these are Innocent homeowners, in a sense, they went after Mr. Fiener with hammer and tong. That didn't mean they're not innocent. <laughs> well, that innocent. They, that sounds like they might be aggressive. They were aggressive. That, that would be a better characterization of it, Your Honor. They, they pursued the judgment against his father, who Mr. Bradley admitted he had no claim against, and that was used by the attorneys as leverage in the case to ask yeah, Mr. Yeah, the point is, if somebody feels like they, somebody's not responding to them and they don't have any remedy, some people, people are aggressive sometimes. That's very true, Your Honor. Yeah. But you're going to make some other points you said. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, much is made of the admission uh, in the answer to the Minnesota complaint, particularly the admission that, that Mr. Fien admitted paragraph 6. I want to first say this was an issue not raised in the bankruptcy court nor raised in the district court, so there's nothing in the record that would, that would show what Mr. Fien's intent was, etc. But the law is, is, I'm afraid, overstated in that, that case. They rely on the case of Phelps versus Benson out of Minnesota, and a closer reading of Phelps versus Benson indicates that what the court actually said was that an admission, in, in this case it dealt with uh, what we would call in federal practice requests for admission. An admission or a, an admission in an answer to a pleading stands as a, a position. But it also says, until some, other, some action is taken that apprises the court and the adversary that the litigant wishes to abandon the position he formerly had taken and change the course of the procedure. And that's what happened here. Certainly, by the time Mr. Fisher, the bankruptcy attorney, apprised uh, Mr. Earhart that there was a bankruptcy issue here. But I would say this is a 1958 case, and it's a little quaint in a way, because what the court says just prior to that paragraph is that, you know, it's a shame, but pleadings aren't given quite the weight that they used to in our modern practice, and there's a lot of looseness here and so forth. Well, this is 1958, and much water's passed under the bridge since then. Your Honor, I would also say that paragraph 6 doesn't say entirely what's been presented here. It says more. Tax law, I remember we had the read-on rule, where something seemed to say something in the first part of the paragraph and said something else later on. Paragraph 6 actually says, and this was noted by the court, that they're attempting to, that they're, their sole intent is to pursue the, the contractor's recovery fund, and that Minnesota law allows them to sue the debtor whether he's gotten a discharge or not. And as Judge Mayer said in his, his opinion, announcing his opinion, that on its face is ambiguous. I mean, what do you do with that? Are you saying that Minnesota allows you to trump bankruptcy law and, and sue the debtor? So what, what does that mean? It's not simply saying we're only going against uh, the contractor's recovery fund. And I think, and I, I'm sorry, I forget which of, of you raised the point. It's not only. No, what it says, I think, hurts you, it seems to me. Uh, I'm talking about now the lawyers defending the, 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 the released debtor. You asked to admit that under Minnesota law, discharge notwithstanding, they can prosecute this case. And you admitted it. You mean you in terms of that's just out. That's an admission. Well, it, it, it's stipulated to us a point of law that you will not contest at trial. But they rely on this Minnesota case to say that, and what the Minnesota case actually says. It doesn't matter what it says. You agree with it. Well, right? they admitted it. In, That's what the question yes. is. It yes. You agree with it. It means it will not be an issue of fact or law at trial. Issue doesn't have to be joined on that because it is concluded. So this $31,000, you, you know, ka that went up, 
it, it seemed to me if I was a counsel to the, the, the debtor, I would say, listen, counsel, there is a discharge and there is an injunction against any suit like this, and I would ask you to cease and desist this suit right now. Was that done? Yes. Mr. Fisher wrote Mr. Earhart a letter uh, in the summer of the year prior to where this went to bank. Went, so but this went, was after your admission? Yes, this was after, yes, this was after that. But didn't you, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm go sorry. Ahead. No, go ahead, answer, go ahead. Okay, okay. Uh, Mr. Fisher wrote uh, the, the appellant's counsel a letter and said, this happened, by the way, put it in context. Mm -hmm. The parties went to mediation, and the mediator said, well, whoa, wait a minute, there's a bankruptcy here, there's a discharge here, what are we doing here in court, why are you being sued? Mm -hmm. You need to contact your bankruptcy counsel and see if they can actually do this. So uh, the, the appellee, Mr. Fina, contacted Mr. Fisher, who was original, his original bankruptcy counsel, and Mr. Fisher wrote a letter to Mr. Madison, which was forwarded to Mr. Earhart, and the letter said, look, this is a violation of the, of the debtor's discharge. I, I require you to stop immediately. And Mr. Earhart wrote back to Mr. Fisher, no, uh, no, this is per we're, we're permitted to do this under Minnesota law. Here's the statute. If you have any adverse case law, please let us know. And at that point, soon after that point, Mr. Fina ran out of funds. Uh, his Minnesota counsel withdrew. And then Mr. R. Earhart wrote a letter to Mr. Fina saying... And the admission occurred before that letter. That's correct. Right. Yes. Mr. Earhart wrote a letter to Mr. Fina saying, well, listen, we, we had a settlement in this mediation, and if you don't go ahead and, and honor that, we're going to proceed against you. We're going to go in, get a judgment, proceed against your, your collecting your father, etc." At the bottom of that letter... There's notice that's saying that this is an attempt to collect a debt. All this adds to the debtor's reasonable apprehension that he's going to lose something from his discharge. But let me answer a question you didn't ask, but I think you might be interested in. Simply, does the admission in paragraph 6 settle the matter for the debtor? It does not. Suppose we admit or agree that that was the only intent the appellants had. Is the debtor not still damaged? Is his credit not still hurt? Is this discharge still not damaged in some way? It is. It is. The debtor has more to worry about than what their intent is. Well, actually, I think that point is well taken. My, my question was to the point that you, you're entitled to court for $31,000, but you must admit that you brought, they brought it on themselves through their counsel, through the way they were defending it. You see, to me, I wouldn't have answered any admission. I would have gone to the bankruptcy court immediately and say. I want an injunction, this is what's happening in Minnesota, as opposed to waltzing with them in Minnesota about this and admitting these things, right? Don't you think counsel should have done that? I want to make sure I understand who you mean by the pronoun they. Do you mean the appellants or the appellee? I, I mean the, the debtor's counsel. The debtor's counsel, yeah. yeah. I, I wouldn't have played footsies with them in Minnesota with that. I've gone straight to the, to the bankruptcy court and said, listen, this is what's happening here, and I want an injunction. In a perfect world, but look what happened when they did. Look to what happened when that finally occurred. The litigation. The litigation. So it's inescapable, I think, in the end. Um, is, is the, I'm just trying to clarify. Is the amount of the award being challenged or just the fact of the award? Uh, the, well, probably the appellant could speak better to what they're challenged than I can. But I thought you might know. What I, I, would, I, I can answer your question, certainly, Your Honor. I'm going to ask them the same question. Um, they're challenging, well, simply everything they can. Uh, they're saying that the court was was wrong in finding that this was a violation of 524A2. Uh, so are, they, are they challenging the formulation of the total of the amount of the award? Not, not that I can perceive, no, Your Honor. Question. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah. I think we understand your position. Let's go to the question. Unless you have something further? I have nothing further, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Funk, you have reserved some time. Do you, I, do you challenge the amount, the formulation of the award, or just the fact of it? We, we don't challenge the formulation. Uh, I do think it, what, it, we do raise that it was an but abuse answer, of discretion. So, but the answer is you don't challenge the amount of the award. You challenge the fact of the award. That's correct. In other words, you don't say he included stuff he shouldn't have included. You don't say he figured it wrong on a formula. You don't say that. No. Okay. Now, I do think the abuse of discretion, part and parcel of that, um, Part and parcel, but you don't challenge the amount. The, um, the, the dollar amount, we have no problem with the formulation. Were you, were you all or nothing then? 
I think that that's what it amounts to. I, we're we're asking for a reversal and completely that there was nothing and that mm -hmm. imposition of any uh, sanction was inappropriate under this. But the award in this case, if you were feeling the award were five hundred dollars, you would still have the same argument. Yes, Your Honor. Yes. Now I want to address this issue of the, whether or not the the Bradley should have sought modification from the bankruptcy court. And I think it's very important to distinguish five twenty four the discharge injunction from the automatic stay of Section 362. 362 is a very broad uh, injunction against any act while the debtor is under the protection of the court. And Congress gave a mechanism for how to get relief from the stay. And it made a mandatory provision for damages if you violate the automatic stay. And I think you need to contrast that with 524, which says when you get a discharge, there's an injunction. You can't seek to hold the debtor personally liable. But Congress didn't provide a mechanism for lifting it. I'm not saying that you can't. But, and, and Congress didn't provide a, a mandatory punishment provision like they did for 362. And so what I think you see here but is an... There's a way to get it modified. There certainly and, is. And, and you pursued it at some point, didn't you? After, well, after, we, after the sanction was awarded, the judge, uh, we, we felt that that was the... So the answer would be, there is a way to get it modified, and you used it. There, that's correct, Your Honor. You but, just think you had to use it before then, but there is a way to modify it. There, the, Congress has an, I mean, uh, the, the court has its inherent power to go back and modify its injunctions. But the fact that Congress did not provide the detailed procedure for modifying it in 524, like they did in 362, is indicative of, of Congress saying, while you're under the protection of the court, you don't do anything to this debtor unless you come and get Congress, I mean, court approval. But if we, if we say... That anything that you think that then indicates that Congress means that an order from a federal court doesn't mean much? Absolutely no. not. That's why that's there is like, a. That's not where you're going to. That's the logical extension of your argument. No, Your Honor. What I think there is, that you do not need to come back to court every time, and I think that's what the Second Circuit said in every Green time, v. Welsh. Every time. every time you want to interact with the debtor on something that may be a pre-petition a, a, a pre-discharge issue, you don't need to go back to court. Pre-discharge issue? Yes. I, I mean, you no, can like... This post-discharge is an injunction, isn't it? That, that, that's correct, Your Honor. You, but if it doesn't violate... Let me come. I know you're arguing, and I'm wrong being advocacy, I'm not, but let's, yeah, let's get this straight now. I'll get it twisted. Mm -hmm. The injunction is post-discharge, and an injunction is an order of a federal court. That's right. Now, I know it's not Congress laying out what they say, what you said, in terms of automatic stay. But an injunction is an injunction. And if you want it lifted, as Judge Chair was saying, you have to come back to the court to do so. And you knew that, correct? And that other side knew that? You, no, Your Honor. Well, if you, you look well, at you're responsible to know what the law is, right? Yes. And, but, but what the second could said in Green v. Welsh when, you went after, when they wanted to go after the insurance right. policy, the court said, you're not seeking to hold him personally liable, so it's not violative of 524, and you don't need to come seek the relief of the bankruptcy court. And I think it's the same thing here. If you're not seeking to hold them personally liable, then you don't need to go seek the permission of the court for relief. But that, is, but that again, is your take after the fact, or maybe even before the fact, but that's one take on what the complaint, the amended complaint does. There's clearly another reasonable look at what that does. Now, I, I think I've already laid it out for you. I don't want to take out your time. You make a heck of a good argument. But the argument that you make doesn't have to be accepted. And it's certainly not as a matter of law to be accepted. It's just a, it's a good argument. Maybe the other side has a good argument, too, on that point. But that doesn't mean just because you can make a strong argument that you might or might not, after litigation, be right on, that doesn't mean that affects all the federal court. I, I don't think, it, it certainly doesn't, but it is our position that the court, once they admitted to that, you think it down. would be, I understand it, you think it would be wise if somebody thought they might be impacting the injunction of the federal court to get some direction from the federal court before you took an action that might, it might be impacted by that injunction? I think that would be very prudent, and I'm sure the parties now, after this is the third court they've been in on this issue, wish they had. Well, maybe sooner or later they'll believe it. But the problem is... I don't think they should be punished for doing something that m didn't violate it right. just because they may have been close. Yes, if you're, if you're in the gray area 
as, as a bankruptcy attorney, I would probably advise you, let's, let's just go back to the court. But when you've taken the action, we are where we are now, it's not whether they should have, it's did their action violate it, and we say it didn't. And I think, um, I, I want to get to this uh, notion, uh, Judge Shedd, that you had said earlier about whether Mr. Fina had to defend his discharge. When the, the testimony was clear that Mr. Fina raised his discharge to his attorney in the Minnesota State Court action. He testified in the bankruptcy court that after the suit was filed, he said to his attorney, what about my discharge? And his attorney told him, the only, they, they are, the, the Bradleys are within their rights to go to pursue this to recover from the fund. And from that point forward, the discharge wasn't an issue in the Minnesota State Here's Court the, suit. I didn't say that as what a lawyer says to him, but as somebody who has been through bankruptcy mm -hmm. and somebody who's getting a letter suing him. Anybody who gets, a lay person gets a letter suing, uh, I guarantee you it's an uncomfortable thing and they wonder what it might mean because somebody is asking for $58,000 from them, and any an attorney's fees, and I guarantee you it causes anybody who's not a lawyer concern. It absolutely does. And That's why clients come to see you when they get those kind of letters and lawsuits. And I, I, it's, it certainly does, but the facts in this case show that he was assuaged of the concern about the personal liability once his attorney said they can do this to recover from the fund. And then he didn't raise the discharge again. Did he defend the suit at all? Did what? Did he defend the suit anymore? Uh, they went to mediation. Why did he do that? Your Honor, because... Why did he, why did he, if he's not at risk at all, why did he even say, well, thank you, lawyer, see you? They, wanted, they had a judgment against the father. If you look at all... How did he do it? I think he wanted to help out his father. I think he used... He, uh, the evidence... The evidence in the record that he wasn't concerned about his own legal status. He was doing all this for his father. I, the, everybody testified that the judgment against the father was a key issue at mediation, getting that only vacated. issue? I, I don't know if that was the, that anybody ever said that was the only issue. Does anybody deny it was a key issue? Does anybody deny that it's a key issue if your father's being sued? But I ask you why, if he thought he was completely protected, why he would, why he would even want to be involved? Did he pay a lawyer? Did this defendant pay a lawyer? Uh, yes. There, there why, were, he, there, why would he do it? Because he wants to pay his father's bills. Maybe that's what he wanted to yeah. do, but he never raised the discharge again. And I think that if he felt that he was that there was a risk that they were going to do no, something, you, you make my point. You don't make your point. You make my point is he thought the discharge meant something to him, but he didn't think it meant he was home free because he continued on in the litigation, defending himself. Well, I think that if if, if the debtor believed that he had per, a risk of personal liability. He would have continued to hammer the discharge away, but he didn't think that because his lawyer told him they can do this as long as they're only once going after again, the fund. Once again, it's what you think about, about what this person did. I think what a person does, I don't know, but I would think that if a person knows a lawsuit is completely meaningless as to him, mm -hmm. it can have no impact on him, why would you defend it? Why would you care? Why would you care? Well, again, would it I think... called a frivolous lawsuit. It just be called something you say don't even... That's just, no offense, but some nut is suing you just ignore it. That's not how he treated this lawsuit. And I think that's an indication that he was concerned about the impact your lawsuit would have on him. You, I know you want to spin it the other way, and that's perfectly fine. But I'm saying, just as your first argument, you can make a good argument, but that doesn't mean you automatically win on that point, is what I think. It's just the way I'm suggesting somebody else can look at it. No, I, I, I understand I have to vote. convince you. <laughs> well, a quick question. Yeah. Smith. You had a judgment against the father, right? Yes. Well, why wasn't that enough for Minnesota to give you your money? You have to. Ha there was a mistake on the website of the MCRF of who the licensee was. <laughs> no, Mr. Website mistake. There was a we there was a mistake on the website of who the licensee was. Uh -huh. They had the father listed. They sued the father, and then they realized the father was was not a source of recovery. They go to the not MCRF. A or not a permitted. Not a viable source. He was had no money. He had no money well, to collect exactly from. That's exactly why you go to Minnesota. What, what, what well, once they got to the Minnesota fund, they realized they had sued the wrong person. Well, why is he the wrong person? Why was the father the wrong person? Because the father was not the licensee, and under the Minnesota law, you had to sue the per the license holder, like, the guy so, who took the test. Well, it was more than just the fact that you know he was not a viable. He was just the wrong party for Minnesota. 
that, that they could not collect from the fund with the judgment against the father. Right. The judgment against the father was a valid judgment. I mean, it was, they, they had a final binding valid judgment under Minnesota law, mm -hmm. but that wouldn't allow them recovery from the fund because there was a mistake on the website. Okay. All right. Now, is your, your argument there was, a, um, there was a mistake on the website or you couldn't get on the website? <laughs> It was a mistake on the website. I, I, I was not involved at that time, but <laughs> okay. that's a very um, okay. timely question, Your Honor. Okay. For the record, strike that question. <laughs> <laughs> I want to clarify. We'll come down and uh, Greek Council proceed to our last case. <laughs>